uh, this talk in particular is uh, kind of as a result of messing around with all kinds of different open source graphics software over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and frequently, uh, I'll want to do something that's not quite in the program, or it'll do something close to what I want to do, but I want the tool to behave in a different way. So uh, over the years, I've kind of like tried to figure out different ways of doing stuff. Um, and just, uh, just out of curiosity, who here has used stuff like Blender or Inkscape or other art software? So everyone, all right. How many people are, would you call yourselves developers to? All right, uh, so pretty good mix. Uh, and this is uh, GIMP. I used GIMP a lot. It's one of the longest running uh, open source software. Uh, when I was in art school, I was taught Photoshop. You get out of Photoshop and then suddenly you don't have money for anything. I kind of, I, I didn't really want to pirate stuff for some reason, plus my computer was kind of wimpy, but I kept hearing about this Linux thing. So I got a CD from, a Red Hat CD from the library and installed Linux and kind of never looked back. And GIMP was a photo editor at the time. Uh, people often complain about its UI, but I kind of got used to it. So now sometimes I've had to go back and use Photoshop and that seems really weird to me. Uh, but GIMP, I'm, I'm used to its quirks and idiosyncrasies, I guess. So it's, you can do a lot with it. Uh, so it's, uh, GIMP is vector, I mean, uh, bitmap graphics. And this is Krita, and I drew this in Krita. Uh, it's, and Krita is also uh, bitmap graphics. It has a couple of layers of vector graphics that uh, are scale, uh, you can scale them without losing resolution or anything. Uh, but it's still mostly a, a vector, I mean a bitmap thing, designed for painting, whereas GIMP is more manipulation as a whole. Krita is much more, Geared for, toward painting. Um, I use Dark Table a lot. Uh, there's another one called Raw Therapy. Um, I've heard some people say that Raw Therapy is kind of easier if you're coming from a more arts background, but Dark Table has like tons and tons of little options you can tinker. Um, so if you know kind of what you want, then you can zero in. You have more options to zero in on stuff with, with Dark Table. So you can pull images right out of your phone. I mean, sometimes your phone, especially digital cameras like Nikon or Canon or whatever. Uh, and mess with different settings, you get higher bit depth manipulation. Uh, other things that I've used is, uh, I use Shotwell sometimes. Uh, Shotwell is a little bit buggy, it frequently crashes on me for some reason. Uh, a lot of people for cat cataloging lots of photos, they use Digicam, uh, which is, it's, that one's pretty good, but it's also way more featured, uh, featureful, and the UI gets really cluttered and it's just kind of annoying to me. Uh, but Shotwell is, I just need it for tagging pretty much just for a light collation of stuff. So Shotwell has been pretty good for organizing stuff and as part of the pipeline. Then Blender for 3D, 3D, 3D animation and uh, modeling and stuff. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more. This is a, a Blender geometry node set up to make like very Pacific Northwest basalt columns. Then this one's Inkscape. This one's uh, vector graphics. Uh, uh, so you can, it's basically a scene graph. You set up a bunch of objects. Each object can be manipul manipulated, scaled, change colors, change the properties. And SVG is a well-supported format these days. Uh, so it's easy to, it's, this is in contrast to bitmap graphics. And this is Godot, a game engine. Uh, most of the, my art efforts the last couple of years has been either photography or video game experiments. Uh, so this is like a, a clock inside of a big cavern, and I'm slowly getting to where you'll be able to like run up the clock here and like do stuff. It's one of my many unfinished art experiments. Uh, Godot has uh, Godot has many ways to, to extend with different tool functionality. Uh, there's other art software, uh, just in case you're not familiar. DTP. There's for desktop publishing. Scribus is is uh, kind of the standard. I laid out is one that I made for laying out my comic books. It has one serious deficiency is that it has really poor text support. As a cartoonist, I draw most of my text, so I haven't had a lot of urge to make an actual text tool. I work on it sometimes, but it's slow going. And audio, there's Audacity and Ardor that I've used uh, just for editing like video, audio, and stuff like that. I use Kaden Live a lot. Uh, that one gets more and more stable as time goes on. I think there's another one called uh, Open shot. I've heard some good things about that. There's a new one called PenPot. Uh, some of these talks are talking about funding, uh, and PenPot has seems to have secured lots of lots of funding initially. So they've got some some money to like pay people to develop. 
Or the weird thing about Penplot is that you have to have it running as a server. Or basically, you can do, like if you're making a, a mobile app, or you can make mockups for interaction design. Uh, but you have to have this, this kind of server running, and then you can have clients connect to the server. You can do stuff with it, but it's a, kind of a strange setup. Another weird stuff like Lily Pond, it's a command line processor for like MIDI music, so you can make sheet music out of uh, just a, a file you throw at it. There's all kinds of other like obscure open source graphics things. And a lot of things are like purpose built for particular art projects, and sometimes they take off on their own, and sometimes they don't. Uh, so now let's talk about. So that's kind of what's the scope of art software out there. Uh, I, I want to talk about now like ways to different categories of extending things. Uh, the, kind of the easiest way is to have uh, just sets of configuration like presets. For instance, David Ravoy, he's a cartoonist, he uses Krita a lot. Uh, often uh, he's featured on, on Krita pages. Uh, over the years he's developed various uh, brush sets for Krita. Uh, released under pretty liberal licenses, um, so anyone can download them, use them, they're not locked behind some other proprietary format. Uh, and other ways to, uh, other categories of tool extensions is kind of, I, I just call them one and done actions. Uh, a few things, software has these, like Godot and Blender in particular. Um, Stribus also has them where you can just write one Python script. Pretty much everything uses Python these days, it's like, kind of really taken hold. Uh, so if you have a bunch of objects and you want them all to be rotated, for instance, just write a quick script, uh, takes, takes the selection and does, does something to it. And then that's kind of the extent, just something that takes a state, converts the state, done. Uh, another way is to create Docker panels. Uh, they're they're pr usually pretty easy to program. Just make a little panel to have a bunch of properties in them and then just mess with the little sliders and whatnot, uh, which is great in terms of time it takes to develop it, but it makes your GUI, your UI, like really cluttered. It's like a, it's a delicate balance between uh, usefulness and, and making things a big mess. Uh, then my personal favorite is on-canvas tools. I uh, like a lot of, each, diff each of these different software, uh, like Inkscape, Keep, or whatever, they all have uh, different ways of doing things, but they have similar things that have to be done, like taking an object and scaling it or rotating it, and each, each of them has like a different way of doing these things. So if you try to go from one thing, one program to another, you kind of have to relearn the interface every single time. It's kind of annoying. For a while, I was trying to find some way to uh, like get these projects to interoperate, like have some kind of tool plugin infrastructure. But that turns out to be an extremely difficult task because all of the internals are so different that you end up having to uh, have developers maintain all of this glue code uh, just to make the, the tool library uh, work. Because there's already kind of a shortage of developers to work on these, the software, so uh, and making glue code to do other stuff is not really a fun task, so it's very difficult to have interoperability. Uh, so, uh, this is how Inkscape sort of does extensions. Uh, they're basically uh, one and done things. You can have a live preview. Uh, this is one that I wrote to make just a long calendar. Uh, it was sort of based on a, another, an already existing calendar uh, Python script. Um, so I, so I opened it up and then tried to figure out what it was doing. Basically, Inkscape has two different files for plugins, or at least two. One is just like a configuration, brings up a box with like properties you can fiddle. So it's just an XML thing. Uh, and then so it uses Python. Uh, what this is doing, Inkscape is taking when you run the script, it's taking the SVG that's there and just sending that entire file to an external process, basically. And then your process does something and then returns SVG. So it's not really interactive. The only interaction is whether you can see it live as you mess with little, little things. But everything is recomputed each time. Uh, so you can get a lot done if you have just tasks that you're doing all the time, like making colors. Uh, that's, it, it, it serves its purpose. Uh, here's some. I meant to have like a, a list of all of these links that I'll like flash up here, but so I didn't quite put that info. So like there's, uh, Inkscape has a lot of documentation, which is great. And it has a lot of people that have made uh, extensions over the years. So there's like a, quite a library of stuff. 
uh, so that if you find something that's sort of like what you want, you can open it up and dig into it and figure out how they're doing it and then tweak it into doing something else. Um, there's also a possibility to make uh, extensions with C++ in Inkscape. There was one company that wanted to do something and Inkscape couldn't do it, so they contributed a fix to make, so you can make a C++ module that can access pretty much all of the C++ internals of Inkscape, which is very powerful, but there is like no documentation. There's only one thing in the code base that has it. It's like grid.cpp. Uh, it's not very explanatory. It's, it's, uh, more on that later. There's one project I was trying to do with C++ extensions. Uh, and this is a screenshot from Scribus, a desktop publishing multi-page stuff. Uh, basically, it's, this, it's a similar way. Uh, Python, so Inkscape does not have Python built in, per se. It just sends as a separate process to do stuff, and then stuff happens. Uh, whereas Scribus, uh, has Python built in as kind of an integral part of it these days. I don't think it started that way, but people used it so much that there's some pretty tight integration. Um, but it's still a similar way as Inkscape. There's just like a script drop down. You can select from stuff. Uh, I made something, uh, since my own tool laid out does not have text, but Scribus does, uh, when I did have a need for text, I usually uh, write something in Scribus and then have it pipe over to my program where you could do like folding into booklets, which was very difficult to do with Scribus, uh, but you know, it could, because that was its purpose, and then send that back to Scribus where it had text features. Um, so it's a little, multiple steps to get booklets with text in them. Uh, but thanks to their plugin infrastructure, it was, it was at least possible to do that. And some other, another unusual thing about Scribus is that uh, from the UI itself, there's a help command uh, and it has pretty good uh, API descriptions of everything. Uh, that right under the help menu, there's a, uh, just an option to, it brings up a whole window, and you can browse the whole API with all the Python calls and, and stuff. It's, it's very convenient. It also has a C++ module capability, but it's, it's, it's more documented than the Inkscape C++ module, but it's still, still a little shaky. It's, uh, I, I think people figure if you already know how to program C++, then you can probably figure out stuff ultimately. But it still takes, even if you do know C++, it still takes quite a long time to figure out internals. I'm less familiar with Krita scripting, uh, but it does seem to have a lot of capabilities, including on-canvas tools. So if you want to make some wacky tool that uh, traces gradients or whatnot, then there is the possibility to do that. Uh, uh, Inkscape and I think Inkscape uses uh, GTK as its windowing library. So you can use, uh, there's a module called inkx, and there's an inkx.gui. Um, so you can use uh, GTK programming with Python in your extra scripts. Uh, whereas Krita uses Qt, or Qt, I never know how people pronounce that. Uh, so there's PyQt where you can make GUIs and other stuff. So there's, there's quite a wide variety of stuff you can do with plugins. And Krita has like a, a list of different plugins and things on their page, so it's uh, pretty well supported. All of these projects so far have uh, lots of different forums and things. So if you do embark on extending tools, there's a lot of help and support you can get for, for doing this stuff. And this is my uh, basalt column generator. Uh, geometry nodes is like a, it's, it's really amazing what Blender is doing with that. Um, basically, you can set up these big uh, node systems to, to do all kinds of stuff. There are so many nodes that latch onto internals of Blender. It makes it much more accessible to artists in particular who don't want to mess with code. But uh, hooking up things with boxes just like makes more intuitive sense, and you can build up kind of a muscle memory for what does what. There are like, at this point, hundreds of nodes though, so in a sense, you're just learning programming languages only with boxes around it instead of individual commands. So it's, the bigger the, the mess is, uh, it kind of kind of becomes, is it really easier? Uh, so I've done some things like this with geometry nodes. There, there's like super powerful. Uh, since I've been doing uh, video game stuff, one problem with Blender is that uh, it's geared much more for display of 3D stuff rather than interactive stuff with colliders. Uh, so in video games, if you have something and another thing runs into it, you have to, it's two different things. It's not just the appearance, it's the, the mesh and a collider. 
whereas Blender doesn't really care so much about that. So you have to do all kinds of other tricks if you're going to export this stuff to be used in game engines, like these basalt columns. It's a little tricky to get it out in an acceptable format. Uh, Blender is pretty unusual in a sense uh, because they have an extraordinary range of ways to do uh, scripting. Um, so you can do one-off Python scripts. And also, Python is completely embedded with Blender. Like, from the start, uh, Python is used to make the entire UI of Blender. Um, so you can, uh, it's, and they have more stuff that requires efficiency programmed in C and C++ and other languages sometimes. But the whole UI is based on Python, so you can get pretty much any, any part of the Blender UI you can change or extend uh, with Python. Uh, so there's like one-off scripts. You can bind uh, keyboard shortcuts or mouse shortcuts even to particular scripts to have things happen. You can assign uh, custom properties to existing objects or create uh, bigger objects or brand new objects with uh, 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 new behaviors. And you can make completely brand new types of objects and then the geometry nodes. Uh, so uh, also, something strange about Blender is that there's an info panel. So if you're making something, uh, it'll show you the command that causes that thing to happen. I don't think they have the display on this one. But when you're, if, if you want to move an object, say, it'll show you the move command, the Python move command, plus with all the parameters, so you don't have to guess the calling order or whatnot. So it makes it quite easy to, to make new plugins to do, to do various tasks. And uh, I've been using Godot, uh, like I said. Uh, and Godot is also kind of in that category. It has a wide array of ways that you can extend it. One-off scripts, uh, you can make new tools, you can do all kinds of stuff with it, uh, or presets. Like this would be, it's, this is using a similar kind of uh, particle system, but just applying different kind of saved resources. You can make it look and behave very differently. Uh, so yeah, so you can manually run scripts. You can make tool scripts that extend objects and give it extra properties. Uh, so like, so like over there in the inspector, uh, you can do the the UI clutter method of just stacking on properties until it gets annoying. Uh, then each time you change a property, it sends a signal internally if your tool script is live, and then it can uh, re reset everything and reconfigure stuff. Uh, this is like a kind of a stack of different things. Like the, I have a procedural grass generator. So each time that the properties are changed over there, sends a signal, recreates the islands, uh, runs a separate script to uh, put uh, vegetation all the way across. Uh, then the, the ball making the bridges going across, uh, that's a kind of an on-canvas tool. And Gitto sort of lets you do that. It's, it's a little bit hacky. Uh, since the scenes in Godot are just scene graphs, like just a big tree of stuff in it, uh, each thing in a scene has to have an owner. But you can make objects in a Godot scene that do not. Oh, you can make uh, scenes that are objects that do not have an owner. So, as a, a in a tool, you can make all these different little doodads and widgets and whatnot that render in the scene. You can make them pretty much anything you want want it to look like. Uh, and when you save the scene, those extra objects, they're technically in the scene, but they will not save with the scene. So it's a, it's a, little, it's a little hacky, but it's, it gives you a lot of freedom to make kind of strange, weird tools. You can see this one is just showing the, the bridge across. Uh, the editor in Godot can be a little slow, especially when you're creating and uh, trashing objects. Yes. Godot. Oh, it's owner, like a parent-child, kind of. In Gado, it's called an uh, O-W-N-E-R. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a special device attached to it. <laughs> and let's see. Yeah, this is another kind of on-canvas tool. Uh, it's just a, a decal projected onto a box. Uh, then another kind of hacky thing you can do in Godot is turn on the physics engine within the editor, which is what this is doing. Uh, it's just creating a bunch of objects and, and throwing them around. Uh, it's, this one's a little hard to, you have to remember what scene you're operating on. 
because if you turn on, if you're making this big scene in Godot and it has a lot of colliders and stuff and things that can move around, once you turn on the physics engine, it turns it on for everything. So if you set up, carefully set up over several hours this delicate scene and then you want to throw a bunch of objects and accidentally forget to do it in a separate scene, then you completely destroy your whole scene. It's, I've done that, it's not fun. And this is another kind of Pacific Northwest biology inspired one. This is bare grass, which uh, you can see it on trails around here, especially near Mount Hood. There are some patches that, that about this time of year I grow up in produce these plants. So this is just a procedural one. Uh, you can move an object around. Uh, this one's starting to get a little ridiculous on the side. It's like just too many little little things. Uh, easy to program, but it would be nicer if it was some on-canvas tool to like mess with different settings. And there's another uh, currently unfinished project to make dynamic waterfalls in scenes. Uh, so in this, uh, the idea is you draw a line uh, and then create a bunch of basically water droplets and then start a physics engine or some other way of making things roll, then trace the path, then based on the paths, uh, stick in the waterfall. Uh, this is kind of inspired by this uh, YouTuber, Ghislaine Giardot. He does a lot of uh, Unreal Engine tutorials and he made one about waterfalls, which is, which is really amazing. So this is like maybe one fifth of the stuff that's in, in his, I'm working on it. Uh, he doesn't use Godot though, he uses Unreal. A lot of things in Unreal you cannot directly import into other engines. And uh, I mentioned before the problem of interoperability. Uh, this is generating palettes from an image. It's something I'm calling Palettista on my GitLab. I uh, basically draw a line, it samples across the paths. Uh, then there's some correspondence or like some formats that uh, different art software uses, but in terms of colors, there's not really a single standard. There's one for color profiles that's widely used, uh, but not so much for color definitions themselves. Um, so uh, I would like to have this tool be a part of all these different software that I use so, that's, so that it's easy to, to move things between them. There was one project called Swashbooker, uh, Swatchbooker, uh, that was trying to make a standardized color format so that all, all the open source graphic software could uh, use the same format and share resources. And it's a good way to go, but uh, he, he, he's worked on other projects and that project is, is somewhat abandoned. Uh, so maybe this over time I can I get enough going. As, that's why I was looking into Inkscape C++ plugins. To, so I want to make an on-canvas tool to be able to do this within Inkscape. And, I was talking to some Inkscape developers and the, and this thing, the Libre Graphics meeting, uh, which is kind of brings together a lot of developers and users of graphics software. Uh, and their advice was to use the C++ plugin because that's the only way to make brand new tools in Inkscape without going full into, into the, the source code. And, and this is just some things of, of my own laid out desktop publishing thing for my comics. Uh, since I made it, I, like you could fold books and generate different ways to fold books to get uh, different impositions for comics or, or other stuff. But since then I keep adding new tools and new tools. Uh, and since, this, since I built this thing from scratch, I, I know the source code, so it's, it's more or less easy to make custom tools for me. But it's still difficult for other people who don't, are not familiar with the source code to, to make stuff. Uh, so it's, it's not an easy problem to solve, like making some kind of standard for, for tools. Uh, when Blender geometry nodes came out, I, I had just been starting to work on a node system where you could make vector graphics with nodes. Uh, but the geometry nodes in Blender were so cool that it kind of, I haven't worked on it since then because and this is much slower than Blender, so kind of, you can do some, some things with it. And like, especially changing the width nodes. In Inkscape, you can draw paths with different uh, widths with the power stroke. Uh, I don't remember what they call them, like filter or something. Uh, but it's, it's very, very clunky to adjust the width. So it'd be so nice in Inkscape to have like just these handles you can drag around. Yeah, so. I remember there was one page about node systems, uh, Blueprint Hell. Uh, that's, they would post 
gigantic like 500 node arrangements of, of stuff that does stuff. It's very easy to abuse, abuse node systems. So they're pretty useful for some things. Um, yeah, so the Libre Graphics meeting, uh, COVID gave it a hit, but it was a, it's been a conference, usually in Europe, sometimes in Canada, I think it was in Rio. So pretty expensive to get there, but usually the talks are recorded. Uh, so pretty much or many of the open source graphics software developers will meet there. So like Inkscape, Gimp, Krita, Scribus, uh, sometimes a couple of guys from Blender, uh, and a couple of a couple of people that use Godot. Uh, there's usually a pretty good mix of both artists and developers, because uh, artists often want to do these crazy things, and uh, software gets you almost there. So sometimes there there are some good collaborations that result from this meeting that's that lead to some some pretty weird and interesting stuff. And that's kind of that's I guess that's it. Um, <laughs> If there's any questions or anything, or there's I have actually. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Uh, Caden Live used to crash a lot, so for a, a, brief, a brief period of time, uh, I'd say yes, because Blender was more stable. I'm late in the last year or two. I, just, I, I don't think Caden Life has crashed on me like at all. So, so I guess it just depends on the complexity of your project. Um, if you already know Blender and you know it's a, like you know its interface, uh, Blender is very consistent in its interface, but it's like totally unlike everything else. So once you learn it, it's great. You can do things really efficiently. But just getting that activation energy, like it's just getting to that point is. Bit of a learning curve. Would you say the mm, I haven't used it in a few years, so these days I, I'm not sure. I I don't know to the extent to which you can do like geometry nodes for compositing. Uh, I think I know like the compositor has node systems you can set up that are fairly easy to use, but with the video editor, I I'm not sure. It's that I'd be interested. It's try it's. Have you been experimenting with generative AI and stuff like this? Uh, a little bit. I, I used, I experimented with stable diffusion for about a week, and it's, it was amusing, but then it starts to seem kind of homogenous. That's completely separate from ethical considerations about where are they sourcing their data, how many artists are they putting out of work for like being able to do all this stuff quickly. It's, in general, I think AI has a lot of power to do stuff. It has a lot of potential, but there are just so many, like, there is a people mentioned anti-capitalist sentiment. I am I am firmly anti-capitalist <laughs> at the moment. Uh, so AI is is uh, being basically guided by these companies that want to nickel and dime you. Is my opinion. Uh, it's they don't care about all the people they're putting out of work. They don't care about making it accessible to to artists to make stuff. But in my opinion, it's there's a question back there. They all have kind of different focuses. Um, so like, sometimes it's, if you're, let's say you're going for a 2D image, sometimes Blender is maybe even better if you want, like, if you want 100 boxes and you want to have shading on them, for instance, uh, it's easier to set up a, just some uh, mound of blocks in Blender and then just render an image. Uh, so Python would work there. Uh, there have been other purpose-built stuff mainly using Python and some other u using shader code. Uh, there was uh, one at the, the Libre Graphics. I was there a few months ago. 
course, now I'm blanking the, the name of the project. Oh, that's going to drive me nuts. Well, he made something so you could make shader code, so it's, which is very C-like in its syntax, uh, but it was also 2D-based and generative, so you could write something and then immediately see the results. So something like that for expressive kind of uh, experiments, a tool like that, purpose-built for that, uh, I, I think that's probably the way to go. Yeah, that's going to bug me. It's, I can almost remember that. It, it was such a cool project, so it's... Uh, Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, another thing at the, the graph, I really love the graphics meeting because there's just such an odd mix, but one, there was a, someone that uh, made a sticker that there was in a circle, tools shape practice, shape tools shape practice. So um, yeah, if, if the tool limits what you can do, in, in one sense, if you have some restrictions, it kind of focuses you to kind of figure out the limits of what you're using. If you have too many options, it, it might be a little overwhelming or you just settle into a kind of a groove. Uh, but yeah, each tool can make and sort of direct what you're doing. Uh, a lot of the programs, in terms of licensing, I guess, a lot of the programs have, uh, they don't claim any artistic copyright or anything to the results of stuff. Uh, but yeah, like if you're using shader things, that has a particular use. Um, so you're gonna get a different aesthetic shader tool compared to like a 3D engine like Blender. Uh, yeah, there's a few tools that are kind of like that. There's a sort of a, a live coding subgenre of like DJing where people, or, or algorithms, if you've heard of those. Uh, so people just uh, do live shader, shader coding and have things go along with whatever's happening or just do interactive things. That's Uh, it would be hard to really make a satisfying mesh in Godot. Um, there is constructive or like CSG constructive solid geometry options in Godot. So you can make a cube and then take a, a sphere, like subtract a sphere from the cube and stuff like that. Um, you can write scripts within Godot to generate whatever mesh you want. Like speaking of generative, like manually generative stuff, you can write a script to make a mesh in a certain way. Uh, I've done that with, with vines, um, so define a path manually and then parse over the path and then make a mesh that follows the vine and changes the width and adds thorns and stuff like that. So it's, uh, Gitto has a lot of stuff that lets you extend it pretty easily. So. so uh, for 3D modeling, do you... Uh, well, actually, I prefer to do it in VR. <laughs> in VR? Like with a VR oh, headset, uh, Blender is pretty good, but I uh, like for really blobby stuff and like intricate stuff. You end up having to click like a million times just to get stuff, uh, which is which is fine, I guess. But it's it just takes a lot of time. I uh, I have there's one program that I've used. Or it's, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that's a big problem. Uh, a proprietary one called Masterpiece VR. Uh, at first, you buy it once, and then you can use it. Uh, and like just being able to wave your hands around and then make a mesh, and like just depending on the pressure of the trigger, like change the amount and expressiveness. It is so much faster just to make stuff like that in VR. Uh, Masterpiece VR has since become a subscription-only platform, which drives me nuts. So it's as yet there is no open source. To, well, actually, that's not true so much anymore. Uh, there was Google's, or there was Tilt Brush in VR that Google bought, and then they kind of ran out of steam on it, and they made it open source. Um, so now that one's, I can't remember the license. I think it's, yeah, I don't, I think it is a, like a, a copyleft-ish license. It is open source. You would be considered free and open source software, I believe. Uh, so technically, you can do that. It's, that's not so much mesh modeling. It's more like brush stroke and adding stuff and effects onto brush strokes. 
threads. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tried that like when it was first there like two years ago, and it was it was not not really a pleasant experience. I, I think it's better now probably. Uh, it seemed at the time it seemed like it was more just for a display, so you could walk around what scene you're making. Uh, I don't know if there are like actual tools you can use in VR in Blender currently. It's, uh, yeah, I should I should check into that some more. Mm -hmm. so, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, like with Blender, I've been using Blender for so long. Yeah, it's uh, to an extent. If you, like, if you, I went to art school and I had been drawing my whole life. So in a sense, if you kind of know the concepts behind things. Um, you can sort of figure out like what they're going for in the different ways that they implement things. Uh, so like everything has RGB components, but there's different ways to specify colors. If you know like a little color theory, then you can see, oh, this, that, that's what this is trying to do. It's trying to set colors this way, and it's trying to use colors in this other context in this way. Um, so in that sense, it can speed up, but unfortunately, there's, there's no continuity between all of these different programs. It's like each has developed them. I, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, Blender has a lot of documentation, uh, but sometimes it's it's if you don't quite know what you're looking for, it can you get lost in this maze of like just stuff that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it 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 takes a while. <laughs> there are some good YouTubers uh, like just searching. I watched a lot of Blender videos. Uh, Creative Shrimp is maybe one of my favorites. Uh, Creative Shrimp. Uh huh. It's I think he's he he tries he's selling kind of. Uh, classes these days, but he's made a lot of free tutorials on YouTube, and it's like really gets gets to the point. Uh, yeah, I mean, Blender has so many different things you can do. It's hard to find like just the right one that gets you where you need to go. Um, most of these projects do have either a Discord or some other forum or, or mailing list. Uh, so if you do get stuck, uh, they're usually pretty inviting. It's uh, Maybe it's just my experience anyway. Sometimes people will tell, just just read the manual or the art equivalent for, for that. But uh, GIMP got some some bad press for, for that years ago. I think they're, they're, most of the projects are pretty welcoming to artists because that's the, what the programs are supposed to be used for. So if you go on a Discord or something, then uh, under a pseudonym maybe, and <laughs> just in case, and get some get some advice for, for that. It's, <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's, I have made a couple of videos, uh, YouTube Tom's Art, T-O-M-S-A-R-T, but I don't know if they're so great or anything. <laughs> there is, you had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, have you worked with like shaders or anything like that, especially in Godot or in Shader Toy? A little bit. Yeah, Shader Toy is awesome. Like just, it's amazing. Like there will be 50 lines of code and it just makes like the Grand Canyon or something. It's, I, 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 I don't know how. So I'm, I would say I'm an okay shader programmer. Um, Godot and Blender let you do, uh, like, just have a shader embedded in uh, displays of stuff. Uh, and Godot makes it extremely easy to go back and forth between, like, a generic material and a shader. 
clear. Like you can set up the standard shader, set up colors and reflection and all this stuff. And then there's just a menu option to convert it to a shader. And then you can make it do other stuff. Uh, like the vegetation I showed earlier, it was kind of like moving around with the wind. And that was all shader based. So like meshes have vertices and they have colors. And all of those can be controlled with the shader. So if you have a wind, it's just like a noise texture uh, making the grass sway back and forth and change the texture from the bottom of the blade to the top of the blade. Mm -hmm. How do you draw? Do you draw with the mouse or do you have a tablet with the uh, that's connected to the computer? I have a tablet, so just a Wacom Intuos. Uh, so do you just like all your software is on the tablet and you use your tablet like, like the Wacom tablet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I draw directly with that. Um, usually, actually, I just draw on paper, like ink on paper. <laughs> and just scan that in. That's how I learned how to draw. So it's, it's what I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm most capable with. Uh, and I usually color it on the computer, though, because if you color it in real life, you have to set up paints and you have to clean brushes afterwards, and it's, which, is, which is fine. Like, if you have time, it's great. But I mean, it's just a, a lot of work. And computers can get you pretty close for, for colors. Any other questions, I guess? All right, all right, thanks for coming.